And Bob, I don't know if you remember this, but I spoke at Times Square and um, Dave Wilkerson was not able to be at the meeting, but you were there. And I, when I spoke, it, it was, you know, I, it was, I enjoyed it. It was an honor to speak at that church. But afterwards, Bob, you came up to me and you said, Steve, that was an awesome, awesome message. And that meant so much to me because I've honored you since I knew of your traveling, the repentance conferences, and the effect that you were having on some of my friends, the solidity of the teaching, the integrity of his ministry. And when pastor came to me the other day and he said, Steve, I'm, I'm gonna ask Bob to come on staff at Brownsville. I turned to him and I said, brother, I've known you a long, long time and I've been around you when you've made a lot of decisions, but this is one of the wisest ones you have ever made. One of the wisest, because you cannot get a better teacher, preacher, to come and, and Brownsville, you need to get used to it. This church is, is destined to have 10, 15,000 members. You need to get, just, it's, it's, just get used to that, okay? Because it's constantly growing. This church is always growing. And as it grows, God is going to have to bring us men who teach the meat of the word and will feed the flock. And pastor is awesome, but he's only able to do so much. And he's going to be here, but there's so much more that's going to be done. And we need people like Bob Phillips that are going to come along and help us out. And so uh, how many appreciate Bob Phillips? Let's welcome him this morning. Kim Schreer to come uh, and, and see right now, if you could. Kim Schreer, if you would come. Thank you for the, uh, uh, not the applause, but just the feeling of welcome and the feeling of being a part of this church. Uh, the applause doesn't mean a lot unless it strikes the heart. And I want to tell you, this church is a wonderful church. My wife and I, my family, we're so happy to be a part of this because God has just uh, blessed us and touched us uh, so, so much. And uh, I want to tell you, you've been a, such a big part of that. I want to thank you for that. I want us to get into the Word. I want us to have some time together. Let's, before we sit, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to touch us this morning. The Lord has uh, laid a message on my heart that uh, some parts of it I shared about a year ago, I think. Uh, I tried my best to get away from it, but the Lord just kept pressing it in on me and pressing it in and for me to share it, and uh, it's, it's different, just parts of it are the same, but it's a message called Face to Face. And the reason that I uh, wanted to share it is because uh, even though some of it I've shared with you before, there was something God was pressing in that's a great need. So I know this morning he wants to touch a nerve, and he wants to bring a freedom and, and a, a deliverance and a release to us uh, in this service when we leave here. And... Uh, I want you to be open and sensitive to that, that God would just begin to allow you to, uh, to experience the freedom that he wants to bring. It's awesome, isn't it, how the Holy Spirit comes and in just a moment can bring an incredible freedom. Things we've struggled with for years, just one touch from him, and it's all melted like wax <laughs> in the presence of the Lord. I believe he wants to do that. I believe he wants this to be a liberating time for, for many of you. Let's, let's pray as we go. Lord, we thank you for what you've already done. We thank you for what you're doing. God, how could we express the thankfulness in our hearts for the way you've already touched us? But Lord, we thank you that we need more. And you made us thirsty for more. You made us hungry for more. Lord, we are not a satisfied people. We have been uprooted and turned upside down, messed with, turned inside out until, God, we have come so far. We don't want to go back. 
We want more, and we want you to take us deeper, Jesus. And we will not rest nor be satisfied because of the hunger and thirst that you have stirred up in us. Lord, we're asking you to take us where you want us to be. God, we want to behold you. We want to stand face to face with you. In Jesus' name, Lord, let this be a time of liberation. In the name of Jesus, Lord, free, be free to do your work. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And I want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. How many of you want to see God face to face? Well, I hope so. Because it's not that easy. There's some things that come with seeing God face to face. I want to read to you 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 5 and 6, For we do not preach ourselves but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. I want you to see particularly verse 6. For God who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. It's awesome what I see God doing. I, I think one of the things that we have to learn, we've all come from religious backgrounds, and I, I agree that much of the religion is just being washed away here at, at Brownsville in many, many people's hearts. And so, but I, st I tell you, we come from such a stronghold of religion that most of us still have a lot still lingering on. For example, I don't know if it created a stir, but I pastored a church before that if Steve had asked two women to come up and pray over the offering, I want to tell you three-fourths of the church would have been going out the door, and the other fourth would have been storming me, all right? But, but, but those are things that God is changing so that he's changing so that all is done for the glory of God. And a lot of the religious strongholds and traditions that have held us and bound us, we've got doctrines to prove they were right. When the presence of God comes in, somehow they're all wrong. And he changes things. Uh, I don't know what you anticipate. How many of you have ever maybe wanted to see somebody face to face and when you first saw them, your reaction was different than you expected? Anybody done that? Uh, we had uh, visiting us, visiting my son Andrew was a little uh, young fellow, um, how old is Andre? He's 11 years old. Uh, he was adopted from Romania. It's the first time he'd been here to the services. And one of the things that he wanted to do was to meet Lyndall. It was a big thing with him. He wanted to meet Lyndall. And, of course, he's not been here. He's seen some videos and some old videos. And it was really interesting because as my wife and I took him back to see Lyndall, he stopped and there he was standing right face to face with Lyndall. And all of a sudden his head started going like this. Your hair is supposed to be longer. <laughs> because he'd seen some of the older videos where Lyndall's hair was long. And that was his first reaction. Uh, I remember my, my, most, my worst encounter and disappointment face-to-face -face happened years ago when I was just turning a teenager. I, I loved baseball, and I wanted to be a baseball player. And my favorite baseball player at that time was Stan Musial. How many of you have ever heard of Stan Musial? Oh, come on now. How many of you have ever heard of Stan Musial? All right. Now, some of you, I know that you're not as old as I am. Some of you are just pretending not to be as old as I am. But, but Stan Musial, of course, was a famous baseball player. And I, I, went, I went with a group, a youth group, not from church because I wasn't saved at that point. But wasn't really, I was going to church, but I still wasn't saved. But I was going with this youth group, and we went to uh, St. Louis. And uh, we didn't live that far. I lived at that time in Indiana. And I was determined that I was going to get... Uh, Stan Musial's autograph. The only problem was that uh, we were in the nosebleed section, you know, uh, way high up. I mean, my, my hero, uh, Stan Musial, looked like an ant from where I was sitting. This, and so I, I was determined that I was going to get Stan Musial's autograph. I was determined I was going to do it. So I, I found out where the ramp was, where the players, at least the entrance to the, to the lower level where the players were, and I went back behind and, 
and I waited until the game was over, and I was trying to find a way to break from security. Remember, I was not a Christian then, but I was trying to break loose from security to try to find a way. And so they were carrying this stuff in, big boxes of stuff. And so I noticed that uh, the security guard was a little lax as he let all these people in. So I just picked up a box, and I followed right behind them. And uh, I walked about three feet behind him, but I walked right on into the place. And I'm so excited, but my heart's beating fast because I'm not supposed to be there. And so I'm walking, you know, here are these concrete walls all painted with, you know, St. Louis Cardinal blue and white. And I'm, I'm rushing as fast as I can. And lo and behold, would you believe it? Coming out of the dressing room was guess who? Stan Musial. I mean, right there. He was dressed. There he was, right there. And I was so shocked. I just looked at him, and I said, uh, hi. And, and he said, uh, he talked with me for four or five sentences, and, and then he said, can I do something for you? And I said, no, it's, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> and, uh, and so he left. And the moment he left, I remembered. I have a baseball in my pocket that I had reserved to get his autograph. And so I, I'm, I'm, I've just been taken back. And so now, when I finally come to out of my days, I start running in the direction where he's running. And I went around this corner. Now, there's another person you may have heard of. I have no idea what he was doing there, but how many remember the old Bonanza series? And there was a big, big guy by the name of Hoss Cartwright. All right? Now listen, I ran, I was running as hard as I could go. I went right around the corner, and I ran just like that into Hoss Cartwright. It caused my feet to get tangled. I fell on the floor, and my baseball fell out right at his feet. And so, you know, here I am. I'm still in the days, and I'm looking, and I recognize who he is. He's not my hero. He reaches down, and he picks up my baseball, and he says, this yours? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you sign that for me? <laughs> so, Hoss, I had a baseball signed by Hoss Cartwright. I don't know if he's ever played a baseball game in his life. I saw something not long ago where Stan Musial's autograph on a baseball is worth $900. Do you know how much Hoss Cartwright's signature on a baseball is worth? See, the point is that when we come face to face with people sometimes, we don't always, we're not always prepared for it. I wonder if we're prepared to see Jesus face to face. You see, the glory of the whole thing is that he is demonstrating that he is revealing himself and he's coming face to face with us like never before. These are exciting. Aren't these exciting times? I mean, you never know what to expect next from him. He reveals this about himself. And then all of a sudden in his glory, you see another aspect of him. But there's one thing about us as religious people, religious, religious backgrounds. First of all, we have a tendency, two things, that I think prevent us from becoming what God wants us to be. Number one, we have a tendency to want to be like everybody else and forget our individuality with God. All right, now let me tell you what I mean by that. I think it's a good thing that someone came up and told everybody here, the men, that they were not going to shave their heads at the men's conference. Because Steve would shave your head. <laughs> let me tell you something. Sometimes people ask me this question. When did you get saved? Now, almost everybody, I grew up in a background where you had to be able to tell the day, not just the month, but the day and the minute, the hour that you got saved. I, I grew up like the problem is, I could do that in the beginning, but as time wore on, I began to wonder, was that really it? Because when I was a sophomore in high school, I had an encounter with God that had a radical change in my life. But a lot of things did not change. Now, I don't know what your theology says about this, but one of the things that I lived with was a guilt wondering how much should change. But let me tell you something. I lived with a partial view of Jesus. You see, I, I came from a background where every service, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, 
There was no teaching. There was no discipleship. It was a salvation message. Now, I'm not against that, but the problem was the church wasn't drawing any lost people. And you don't grow on just a salvation message. So whenever I began to walk out and face the things in the world, I had no tools. I had nothing. I didn't know what to do. Not only that, I did not have a good image now uh, of what it was like to be a Christian. See, I, I, that's why I appreciate Steve's message so much because he feels that God's giving them the task of redefining sin. If sin's not redefined before long, you, how many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you begin, you come and you had a conception of what being a Christian was like and God has radically changed that in the last four years. Well, see, what happened is when you receive that, many of you grab hold of it and you begin to get the sin out and you begin to respond. Now, some of you got saved probably for the first time. You became genuinely born again. You weren't born again before. Some of you, some of you begin to receive what you'd never received before because the power and glory of God was so strong. May I say to you, I don't think it's a great triumph to repent of sin in conditions like this. Now, don't misunderstand me. Because God is so awesome, just like last night. I was preaching in Mexico City, Pastor Aurelio's church, and I was sharing some things, and the Spirit of God moved in in such an awesome way, and people began to fall on their faces and repent. But one of the things that came to my mind is this was 15 minutes into my message, and my first thought was, I haven't said anything yet. And so I just pressed on a little bit further because I didn't want to lose it. I didn't know what they were responding to. And so I went on about another five, ten minutes, and I heard the Holy Spirit say, when are you going to stop talking? I mean, it was clear. When are you going to stop talking? So I stopped. And God just broke out. But, but what I'm saying is that when the atmosphere of the Holy Spirit is so strong and awesome and His presence is so real, it's not that difficult to repent of sin. Yes, there's a battle with the devil. Yes, there's overcoming of pride. I'm not belittling that, but I'm saying to be saved or to get rid of sin in an atmosphere like this, I don't know if it's easier, but I'm telling you, it's more conducive to people responding last night. God was so awesome in this place as Steve stepped up. I mean, he said a few words. And there was an altar call that many pastors and preachers and evangelists would be proud to see after having preached an hour of hard, hard, biting preaching. But just in a moment, just a few words, the altars were suddenly filled and flooded with people weeping. Now listen, not just looking, weeping and crying out to God. You see, in this kind of an atmosphere, God moves so powerfully that in His presence, Sin is something that gets exposed whether they hit your button or not, whether it was your sin pronounced or not, whether the message was about your problem or not. There's just something about it. You have to give it to God. That's an awesome thing. And we dare not take, take it for granted. It's wonderful to be in this country. How many of you have gotten saved 10, 12, 14 times already in the revival? <laughs> You have an experience with God. You see, when I was a, much later, I was a businessman. I had such an awesome encounter with God. So radically changed me. The conviction was so deep and so strong that I wondered if I had even gotten saved as a sophomore. All I know is, I, and one week I think it was when I was a sophomore, and the next week I think it when I was in business. All I know is, thank God he saved me. I can't pinpoint the date. What I'm saying is that we get, so, we get so trying to conform what we're like to, to someone else. And we miss what God wants to do uniquely in our own lives. How many of you follow what I'm saying? The second thing is that we have a tendency as Christians to absorb things too quickly. See, God's plan is for us to take it in, absorb it, and then work its way out. We have a tendency to absorb it, get it, and then think we've got all of it. And then we run with it and we find out that there are deficiencies in our walk with God. And what I'm saying to you is that the only thing that I know that changes that is if we'll press forward to a full vision of the face of Jesus Christ, if we'll make it our intent to see Him and behold Him, every facet of Him, not just one part, 
Uh, look, it, look with me at uh, chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 18, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. That's one of my favorite verses, and especially now because it tells me something mighty. It tells me that as I begin to behold the Lord, whether I feel the change or not, there's something happening. How many of you have noticed that? You're in the presence of God. You're beholding His presence. You're seeing Him move. Maybe you had a deep emotional encounter. Maybe you didn't. But you, as you sit in this atmosphere, you've noticed that there are things that are changing about you. Now, I want to make one thing very, very clear. When it comes to change, I'm not referring to sin. There is no gradual process of being released from sin. It's direct, it's immediate, and it's right then. And the freedom should be there. But I also sense this. I, I believe God's given me a, a pastor's heart. I, I want to say something that's not a part of the message, but it's not an advertisement. But I tell you, John Kilpatrick is the finest example of a pastor that I have known in 30 years. The finest example of a pastor. I mean, everything he does... You watch him, everything he does relates to this congregation. And what he's trying to do is the way he watches over the flock and the way that he delivers the message. I don't consider myself a pastor on that caliber of him. He's the finest I've seen. But I do know God's given me a shepherd's heart. And one of the things that I feel is I look over Brownsville and I see you from time to time and I begin to... And that is that I am convinced that there are people here that should be a lot further along than they are right now. And I don't say that to condemn you. I'm saying that not from the standpoint of just conviction of sin, but from the standpoint that after you've gotten the sin out, some of you have failed to go on and behold the face of God the way He wants you to. And there's a stunting to your growth. Now, I'm convinced that there are many of you here that are trying their best to be like somebody else. And not taking into account that you're going to grow and you're going to develop into God's own personality for you individually, not somebody else's. Now, I'm not Steve Hill. Steve Hill's not Bob Phillips. Bob Phillips would not be able to do what Steve Hill does. My personality is not the same as his. Some of you try very, very hard to be like Steve or like John Kilpatrick or like somebody else and, and you're trying your best to be able to think the same way and do the same things and I'm saying there's a point to which that is very, very important. But there's also a point to where God wants to make you individual. But regardless of what he wants to do with you, I am convinced we do not yet know the measure of victory that God wants us to have in our lives. And it's because we are not beholding consistently the face of the Lord. I notice about something about Lindell. It seems to me, and I mean this sincerely, this is not... When Lindell announces that he has a sore throat, whether I hear him doing it back there or back at... The choir will know this. There's something about it. It seems like when he comes out and gets on this machine here, that something begins to happen. He turns it up about five notches beyond what it was when he's got a good throat. Are you hearing me? How many of you noticed that? I mean, it's like there's a fire that comes. And I, I tell you why, because the man knows how to go before the presence of the Lord. He knows how to worship the Lord. He knows how to change something that would defeat some people into a victory. And that's the sign and mark of maturity in worshiping God. You find a man that can do that, you know that you found a man who spends time beholding the face of God. That's not something that just happens. Other Christians that should be experiencing the victory are often defeated by the minutest little thing, by the smallest challenges that are there because they've not yet learned to behold his face. God wants us to behold his face. He wants to mature us in the Lord. I tell you, what an opportunity to be in God's awesome presence as we are. That's why he wants us to get the sin out. and get. I'm convinced that he wants us to get the sin out so he can take us where he wants to take us, so he can do in us what he really wants to do. Now, I don't know. How many have ever wondered what the face of Jesus must have looked like? Anybody wonder? 
about eight of us. Well, I have. I know why we don't have a portrait of him. I know why we don't have a photograph. I know why. I mean, you understand God could have caused man to invent photography at the time Jesus was born. That could have happened if God wanted to do it. Scientists just stumble on things, but I don't think they stumble. I think God has a lot to do with it. But at any rate, it could have been that somebody would have painted. There were artists back then. Somebody could have painted a picture. It'd be worth millions and millions. It'd be priceless. But the other thing, it'd be in somebody's temple somewhere, and thousands, millions of people from all over the world would be going to that museum or that temple or wherever it was and bowing down and worshiping that picture and completely miss the image of Christ. So that's why we don't have a photograph of him. That's why there's nothing there, because that's what we do with stuff like that. I mean, if we just had a bone of his little finger, we would go worship the bone of the little finger. That's what man does. God wants to give us a fresh image of what he's like and who he is. John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, had been passionately longing for a direct vision of Jesus. He wanted it badly. And the answer came to him one day in a dream. I just want to read to you what he, what he said. This is what he wrote. I asked the Lord that I might grow in faith and love and every grace, might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. I thought that in some favorite hour at once he'd answer my request. And by his love's constraining power, suddenly my sins would give me rest. Instead of that, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart. Now listen to this word. He assaulted my soul in every part. Lord, why is this? I tremblingly cried. This is the way, the Lord replied. From self and sin to thee free, that thou mightest find thy all in me. See, I, I want you to understand that if we're going to allow God to give us a vision of himself, he is going to assault our soul. Are you prepared for your soul to be exalted? I don't care how strong you are in the Lord. I don't care what point you are in the Lord. I don't care what place you are. You are going to have your soul assaulted by God when you come face to face with him. Now, the reason I know that is because, you see, what God wants to do is he wants to build a victory in us that's so strong, so powerful, that he wants us to defeat the enemy. Now, understand, he has already defeated the enemy. He wants a people that can walk in the power of that victory so consumed by him, so full of him, so assaulted first that they're free in their spirit and their eyes are only on God and they walk in the power of that victory. I believe we cheapen the word victory too much. I believe we cheapen it because we talk about victory but we're far short of the total victory that God wants to bring. I'm not encouraging you to not speak of victory anymore. I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying if we get our eyes on Jesus, there's so much more. So much more. Job. Job had this idea that he knew God and understood God, and God had this idea about Job. This is not a sinner. There's not somebody out there just doing all. He's not rebelling against God. In fact, the scripture says in Job 33 9, Job said of himself, I am clean without transgression. I am innocent. Neither is there any iniquity in me. That's a pretty bold statement. God said about him, there's none like him. He's perfect and upright, one that fears God and turns away from evil. Yet when he had a face-to-face -face encounter with God, it's totally different. Job chapter 42 says that he saw God. He says, I have heard of thee with the hearing of my ear, but now my eye sees thee and I repent in dust and ashes. You see, when we see God, Job, didn't know there was something there. He, Job was wiped out. He was assaulted before the vision of God. How many of you are following what I'm saying? See, if we could just go through and just see what it does to the sinners, that's one thing. But I tell you, the Bible doesn't record what it does to the sinners as much as it records what a vision of God does to those that are walking in a certain place with God. I mean, it's, it's awesome when you begin to look at it in just a few of the examples. I mean, Jacob... Jacob was a cheat and he was a trickster. There's no question about that. He has an encounter. We might look at Jacob and say, yeah, I can understand why Jacob was brought to his knees and said, I see God. But what about Isaiah? 
Isaiah's been preaching for several chapters. He's already begun to talk about how God with his blood will make your sins white as snow. He has an understanding. He has insight. He's been ministered to by the Holy Spirit. And then all of a sudden he has an encounter with God. And he says, woe is me. Ezekiel. Ezekiel, who walked in obedience to God, when God said, get up and go here, he went. Here's Ezekiel. I mean, here's a man who wants to follow God. He's, he's captured by a vision of God, and he's prostrate on his face. I mean, it goes all, all through the whole thing. The one that amazes me perhaps the most is a man by the name of Daniel. 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 The only way they can get Daniel by law is to pass a degree, a decree that that catch him in his prayer life, that's a pretty honorable thing. I mean, if the enemy wants to try to get you, put you in jail and have you misfared, it wouldn't it be wonderful if he had to pass a law, the only thing he could find in your life, he couldn't find compromise, the only thing he could find in your life is you're so consistent in prayer. Morning, afternoon, morning, noon, and night. And they could find you there. So you pass a decree that if he's doing that, praying to his own God, that they would arrest him. And yet when Daniel in chapter 10 saw God face to face, he says all of his beauty turned to blackness. He said everything about him was suddenly assaulted. There was nothing about him that was really good. All that he saw was suddenly worthless before God. Peter. Now this is an amazing one to me. Because Peter's been walking with Jesus. He sees him. And he's, now he's at a place where he's been fishing in a certain place all night long. And he throws the net over at the bidding of Jesus. I, I can imagine what was going through Peter's mind. He's a fisherman. I believe when he threw the net over, probably he's thinking to himself, you know, Jesus, you know, I really know you and I respect you and I, I have a love for you, but and I know you know all about this temple stuff and you know about righteousness and holiness, but Jesus, I, I've been fishing here all night long. I know fish. I know fish, Jesus. I mean, when's the last time you had a pole in your hand? I know about fish. But if that's what you want me to do, I'll just do it. And so he throws the net over to the side, and what happens? He gets such a catch of fish that other boats have to come. It's about to swamp all the boats. And Peter cries out. What does he cry out? Man, where's this guy been? Can you imagine? We can pay for the whole ministry with just the fishing profits. No, he says... Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Why? Because in the simple mundane things of fishing, and the things that he knows best, he suddenly saw Jesus as knowing better than he knows. Oh, it wasn't some dark sin. That it wasn't adultery. It wasn't. It wasn't drugs wasn't even lying. It wasn't that at all. It was simply the fact that he was faced with a holy God who knew what he thought he knew better than he ever knew. And that alone brought him to his knees and said, God, I'm so sinful to even think that I could know one little thing better than you. It's an awesome encounter. Assaulted his soul. Of course, I, I like the one of John. You know, John just... Uh, I mean, here's John. He... He's at the Lord's Supper. I mean, holy, holy moment. It's where the betrayal is about to take place. And the scripture says that John is laying his head over on the bosom of Jesus. Just laying there. But when it comes to a fresh vision of him in his glory, on the Isle of Patmos, his description changes. That he falls on his face as a dead man. You see, what I'm saying to you is that God has more encounters for us of His holiness and His glory and His greatness. And as He takes us progressively to that greatness and that glory, we will be brought further and further and further on our faces. Some might say, well, I'm not so sure I want an encounter like that. Well, when I consider those encounters, I, I, I don't, there's a reluctance in me. 
and, and, and an eagerness. Yes, I say, God, show me your glory, but I, I've been in his presence enough that I know there's a tenderness which I say that now. I say, God, show me your glory, but there's something about me. Say, God, prepare me for it. I, I don't just flippantly say like I used to. And what's happened in this revival has been a big part of that. But I can remember I'd be crying out to God, Oh, God, come down in this church. God, come down and show yourself strong. God, bring revival. God, do something to us. Never realizing that he was going to assault my soul. And even when I found out that he does assault my soul, it's with great tenderness that I say, I won't stop crying it because I want it. But I won't stop crying, God, with your mercy, with your grace. I know what you're going to do, but I've got to see more of you. Now, then when I turn and I see what he did with those to whom he assaulted their soul, all of a sudden there's a joy that begins to rise up on the inside. Because then I begin to see what, he didn't leave them in the dust. No, Job became such a powerful intercessor that he returned to him double all that he lost. But more than that, he begins to have power to intercede that his friends begin to know God one after one after one. They begin to get blessed. And I think, God, if you have to assault my soul so that I can see you that way, so that I can pray for those that I love and those that are hurting and those that I don't seem to be able to reach, then God, assault me. Assault me. When I, when I begin to think of what happened to Isaiah, I don't know what your hang-ups and reluctances are. I have to be honest with you. One of the things that I fight tremendously as a, as a minister is rejection. And, and I'm, I'm talking, I've been teaching on Wednesday nights about the process and principle of reception, and the principle of rejection. And I want to just tell you something. A lot of what I'm sharing comes directly from the assaults and battles that are on the inside. Because I know what it's like. I don't know where all it came from. I don't know. I've cried for deliverance. I've cried for everything to get rid of it. And I don't live under the cloud of it. I don't live under the defeat of it. I want you to hear me. But I want to tell you something. Sometimes it comes at me and it will assault me just like this. I mean, it'll hit me right out of the blue. Nothing has to have happened for it to be wrong. I don't have to have made a mistake, but it will hit me just like that. And it's almost like getting hit with a Mack truck. Now, I don't pattern myself after that or say it's a reason to keep it, but Charles Spurgeon used to get hit with fits of depression that were so long, he would take long periods of time off because they would hit him and he could not recover immediately. There was a time period. He had to wrestle with God. Some of you here this morning are facing the same thing. You're here in the revival, and there's areas where I'm not talking about sin. I'm not talking about, and by the way, those things can cause sin to come if you don't overcome them. But some of you about it saying, you're wondering to yourself, I feel it as I pray for this church. Some of you are wondering, why, am I, why don't I have victory over this yet? I'm not talking about lust, and I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about those areas that you've repented of. I'm talking about your own weakness, and you wonder, why do I get assaulted so much? And I want to tell you, the only answer I know is to get alone with God and worship Him until I can get a fresh vision of who He is and what He's like. That's the only victory i found over it. Now, I know that people, I've had that happen. I, I don't share this very often, which indicates I, I really feel comfortable sharing anything I'd want to share in this church because I, I, I know, I know that I'm received. But let me tell you something. My wife, for example, I've mentioned this before. My wife and I are totally different. My, my wife has this amazing capacity to have immediate faith. Immediate faith. A crisis comes. It's like... The heart of the devil hits her. The crisis comes, her faith just jumps up like that. I mean, it's ready. It's just like a shield. And there's a calmness and a peace that's there. Not me. I have to fall apart first. <laughs> I, I, I've got, I, I get hit something. Sometimes when something hits me real hard, blindsided. How do you know what it's like to be blindsided by the devil? When he blindsides me, when that happens to me, I fall apart first. And I've said, God, I'm no Paul, but I tell you, if there's a chapter that I can identify with, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul says, Lord, take this thing away from me. I've asked you three times. It means more than that. And God says, sometimes it's not the answer I want to hear. My grace, 
It's quite sufficient for you, son. My grace is. And so I have to go through that process. I wish that mine was that I'd gotten caught up to the third heaven and the devil had to keep me humble, but that's not my problem. Well, but what I'm saying is that I have to go to God. Now, some of you have to understand this. You're different. I'd like to be able to handle it the way my wife does. I want the immediate faith that rises up. But I'll tell you something. When I get with God, there's a fighting spirit that begins to rise up on the inside of me, and I plant my feet, and I say, no. You're not going to control that. You're not going to have that way. Now, some of you have to realize that regardless of which personality type like that you are, the answer comes because my wife spends time beholding him. The answer comes from me because I spend time beholding him. The answer is the same. The reactions are different personalities. Am I making any sense to you? Let me share some facets. Actually, you see, we don't have a photograph of Jesus, but the Holy Spirit has drawn on the canvas of Scripture a pretty accurate picture. The first one we know a lot about here and we're learning more and more about. I want you to turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, verse 10. Let me tell you why I'm sharing this with you. When I was wrestling with not preaching this message because I had something else I wanted to do, I had a message entitled Living Too Close to the Edge that I really wanted to bring. But I couldn't get away from this. I could not get away from it. Even this morning I went to my office uh, and, I, and I wrestled with the Lord to try to get away from this. And, and I couldn't do it. And I said, Lord, what is it that you're wanting to say? And, and, and this is it. It came so clear to me that there are some, I'm going to use the word many, and as far as God's brought you, the wonderful things he's done, still there are things that the enemy brings to your life that don't just rattle you for a while, they don't just shake you for a while, they're able to find a groove in your life. You understand what I mean? The enemy is able to cut a groove in your life so that when he brings that thing up to you, not only does it temporarily defeat you, it stays as a permanent defeat. And you're trying to figure out how do I get victory over this thing? And the problem is you're looking for a new experience. You come to the revival and ask for a fresh touch. And you know something? God's so gracious, he does it. He's so full of grace and mercy, he touches you. But there will come a time, if it hasn't happened already, when you come and the touch won't immediately release the, relate, release the problem from you. Well, what will happen is God will keep you out there in the forefront and it will keep hitting you and hitting you and hitting you. And there are some of you that are here wondering, with revival at Brownsville, with the presence of God so strong, why is it that the devil is able to keep hitting me and hitting me and hitting me with the same thing? I want to say it again. If that's happening with sin, sin is not some process we get rid of. God brings immediate deliverance to sin. But some of these attitudes that we keep, fears, rejections, loneliness, things that would be there, isolation. I could go on and on and on, but some of the things that have a tendency to linger and you don't press through to victory, those things then come and assault you and produce a groove in your life so that all the enemy has to do to detour you or to waylay you or to defeat you is to put that thing there. And if you're not careful, it will break out into other forms of sin that have once been conquered. Are you hearing me? More than one man has been caught battling with loneliness and fighting, fighting loneliness only to find himself at a pornography shop somewhere to think that he can fill the loneliness. I'm telling you. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 3, verse, or excuse me, 1 Peter 3, verse 10. Let him who means to love life and see good days refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile. Now look at this. And let him turn away from evil and do good and let him seek peace and pursue it. 
For the eyes, you could say the face, for the eyes or face of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, this is an awesome thing to me that if I don't bring things into the presence of God, if I don't behold his face, if I don't come before his presence, then before long there could be something crop into my life or your life that would be causing him to set his face against me. That's a frightening thought for the face of God to be against you. You say, well, what about these things? Why does God allow this stuff to come? Why does he allow these things to hit me? Well, there are a lot of reasons, but one of them is Joshua 11, verse 20, which says that I allowed, in fact, he says, I hardened the hearts of the Egyptians so that they would fight against my people, so that they would be utterly destroyed. Not the people, the Egyptians. You understand that there's times when God allows an assault to come because he's trying to shake us up to get before his face. Sometimes that's the only thing that drives us to worship him and in helplessness get before him and say, God, why is this happening to me? And God says, I'm allowing it to happen because I want to defeat this thing in your life. I want you to find the place of absolute victory, not a partial victory. I don't want to beat them real bad. I want to utterly destroy them. See, some, some Christians are content to give the devil a good beating. That's short of the victory that God wanted to the cross. God doesn't want to give the devil a good beating so you can turn around and fight a battle again. One of the things that characterizes the children of Israel in the wilderness is that they fought battles after battle after battle. They fought battles, but they never gained any territory. You see, God doesn't want us in a place where we're fighting battles all the time that are the same battles. He wants us to fight battles. In fact, there will always be a battle, but there ought to be battles to gain new territory, to find the spoils of fresh victory, battles that take us beyond where we've been, not to keep going in circles fighting the same wars. And God has a dreadful face. I call this the dreadful face of God. I tell you, it's a dreadful face because, because there is two elements or sides to the character of God that we dare not forget. Behold the kindness and the severity of God. I, I don't think God will ever stop allowing us to see the severity of his face. The closer we get to him, the more severe that face comes the more we begin to build up a fear of sinning and a fear of losing that presence. There's, there's a little story that I tell on the fear of the Lord, but it's, it's about a woman who lived on the backside of a, uh, a national forest. I love this story, and I tell it frequently, but the reason I like it is what it did. She's a tiny woman. I think she's about... Five six or five four weighs about a hundred and fifteen hundred. I forget how much it was. It's an article. It's a true story. And one day she was uh, she was in her kitchen and she heard this scream, the scream coming from the backyard, and she rushes out there. Well, she looks out the window and she sees. They don't normally have a problem with grizzlies, but this grizzly has come off of the national forest and has come into the yard, and her young boy was out there playing in a swing set. And she looks out, and here's this grizzly standing on his back legs, hovering over her boy, who's laying there crying and trembling. And she heard that cry, and she recognized it. She rushes out of the house on her way out. She doesn't grab a shotgun. She doesn't grab... She grabs the only thing that's close by. She grabs a broom. And with that broom, she attacks the grizzly. Not smart. But as I was reading that story, 
I understood what God was trying to communicate to me. See, because he wants us to see his face that we will so hate sin that the fear of God will be there. There'll be fear of nothing else whatsoever, just the fear of God. No other fear, nothing else there, just the fear of God. And we'll so hate sin that we'll charge the grizzly of sin and the devil in order to beat him off with anything that's there. But we're not going to allow him to devour our love object. And Jesus is the object of our love. See, God wants to change the way we fight sin. He, he wants to move us from fighting sin because it makes us miserable to fighting sin because it threatens the presence of God. See, I think that's what 2 Corinthians is trying to say, beholding from image to image, glory to glory. You don't want anything to touch that. There's another face of God, if you turn with me uh, to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. These are, to me, these are like lines or drawings to enable us to see what God's face really looks like. I like this one. Luke chapter 9. There's two of them here in the chapter of Luke, ninth chapter of Luke, verse 51. And it came about when the days were approaching for the ascension that he resolutely, the King James says, steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Friend, if we're going to walk in victory with God, we've got to understand that if you're going to behold his face, his face is, now he's been to the cross. Don't misunderstand me. His face is constantly beholding the cross. If you're going to follow God, it's always going to lead by the path of the cross constantly. So if we don't want to go by the path of the cross, we're not going to behold very much. You know, I, I tell you what I think he wants us to get from this is courage, to have a fresh courage. See, sometimes I find that there's a battle within me when I have to die to something that is protecting me. An attitude can be one of your defense mechanisms. And when God asks me to die to something that's protecting me from being hurt, or protecting me from being exposed or protecting me from something, the tendency is to say, God, you can touch anything else, but if this goes, I'm stripped naked, I'm vulnerable, I'm transparent, I might get hurt. And God says to the cross, son, look at my face. What happened when I went to the cross? Yeah, but God, Jesus, you didn't have those same hang-ups. You, you. But what happened when I went to the cross? And I'm forced to admit that it was through the cross that the resurrection came. And I'd rather have the power of his resurrection as my defense than that which I'm holding on to. But it still hurts. And the only way you can do it, I'm telling you, it, it's difficult when somebody maybe has wounded you or hurt you or, or maybe in some way that they're coming at you and, and, and it's, it's digging at you or maybe, maybe you failed in an experience and you're asked to do that same thing again. But the last experience you had, you failed, broke my heart because there's a man that I believe is called, I believe he's called to the ministry. Maybe he isn't. I didn't try to convince him. I don't think I ought to convince anybody that they are called to the ministry. But I, I met with him recently, and he made this statement. He said, I've been so wounded. He said, I got tired of standing up in the pulpit and feeling like my sermon was a good sermon or a bad sermon. He said, it ripped me apart. In other words, what I'm saying to you, when he began to preach, he loved to preach, but when he began to preach, one of the things that he said, he said, precious brother, but one of the things that he said is I had to step away from preaching because I was too destroyed when I preached a bad message. And I was crying out saying, get behold, behold the face of God, get before him, let him strengthen you. And it doesn't matter whether you feel good about your sermon or not. You see, God will deliberately put you in situations that you feel uncomfortable in or that you have been defeated in because he wants to assault that area, not only in your soul, but he wants to carry you forth to a dependency so that you will trust him like never before. And that area will never have a place of defeat. You'll fear nothing but the fear of the Lord himself. Am I making sense to you? 
There's another one here. Oh, I like this one, verse 28 and 29. And some eight days after these sayings, it came about that he took along Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different and his clothing became white and gleaming. Now, there's a lot that this could say, but I tell you what I feel that what God is wanting to say, understand it, grip me one day, to realize what the glory of God is capable of doing. We look at this and we say, that was Jesus. And, and yes, his glory was showing forth, but understand this, Jesus had voluntarily laid aside his glory. He wasn't walking as, the, as, as God. He was walking as the Son of Man on earth. He was walking as a man dependent upon God. He was as dependent upon the operation of the Holy Spirit and the voice of God as you and I. He didn't come down here and say, look at me, I'm going to perform as God and act as God and you follow me. He came down dependent upon the Father to hear what he said, see what he said, was doing, and, and depend upon the Holy Spirit. Am I making sense? So when I saw that, it hit me. Now, he's very much God and very much man, but here what it was. The glory that they saw was the glory that came down on a human body and radiated out past the clay walls of his humanity to produce such a glory of light that no man is capable of producing. Now, he was without sin and he was without weakness, but it dawned on me that we could actually get touched by the glory of God. We could behold his face and be changed so powerfully, touched by the glory of God, so that the glory of heaven would radiate through the limitations of our flesh. Oh, I'm not talking about the natural limitations. I'm talking about the hang-ups and the weaknesses and the difficulties. He can transform us into something we are not. But what he intends us to be, he can make a preacher out of somebody that stumbles over his words with the glory of God. He can take somebody that doesn't know how to do something and give them wisdom to do it beyond their capabilities. God wants us to behold his face so he can transform us into that's which we don't know what to do and how to do. That's awesome. He wants us to see that in him. I think of, I think of David. It's always amazed me. I, I guess I read Paul's warnings. He said, I have fear of becoming shipwrecked. That's not my fear, but I... I guess I'm always amazed and kept right on my toes when I think of David and, and the inconsistencies about his life. A man with a heart after God, a man who defeats Goliath, a man who's defeated a bear and a lion by the power and glory of God, a man who faces the, the one whom all Israel was trembling before, Goliath. And then moments later, days, Weeks, months later, he's running for his life from Saul to the point where he comes to grips with the fact that he's so worn down, he's so defeated, he makes a statement that I never will get over. He says, there's nothing better for me than to cross over to the land of the Philistines. Man can get like that. Our weaknesses can get to us to the point where we say, I'm going to give up. I'm going to cross over. But the grace of God, I'm not encouraging you to cross over because that's a dangerous area to be in. But I do want you to understand that there was something missing in David's life. He did cross over. And then he has his most embarrassing experience. The Philistines want to kill him. So he feigns being a madman, slobbers all over himself. This man of dignity and this man of God slobbers over himself to act like a madman. And then if I don't leave him alone, he's just crazy. What a witness. And then, and then, God has to do something to uproot him because he's become comfortable with his weakness. And so he comes back to his village and he finds that his village has been raped and pillaged and destroyed and it's burning even the bricks and the wood are ash being burned they're hot the wives are gone the cattle is gone everything's gone I tell you you need to hear this because if you are wallowing in your weakness 
And I use that word because that's what the word Philistine means. It'll cause you to wallow in the dust. If you've gone over, maybe you're not sinning in some areas, but you're wallowing in the weakness. You're wallowing in it to the point where it's like you're just rolling in the dust. And the enemy's got you captured and you're saying, I don't know if I can go on. I, I, you know, I just don't know if I can overcome this. Let me tell you something. David's men wanted to stone him. He's got nobody on his side. There's nobody standing with him. How, what's he going to do with God? How's he going to go to God? Is he going to go to God and say, God, forgive me? I mean, you know, I made a few mistakes. I mean, surely he's got to feel, God, what right do I have to even ask you to do anything? You gave me victory over Goliath. You gave me victory over the blind and the bear. God, you preserved my life, and I gave up, and I went over to the Philistines. God, how, what right do I have to ask you anything? And here, my family's gone. Everything's gone. But you know, that's not what David did. Doesn't say much, but he repented of where he was. And he goes and he gets before the presence of God face to face. And he says, Lord, what do you have me to do? Do I stay here or do I pursue? And just like that, God says, go get him. Pursue. Because he had found the place that God wanted him, face to face with God. I wonder if God's doing that with you. The bottom line of the story is marvelous. The scripture says, and David recovered all. Not one thing was missing, neither great nor small. He recovered all. Oh, could you be battling with something this morning, and not just this morning, but in your life, where you're allowing the enemy just to create this wallowing in the dust, and what God's saying is, I'm wanting you to experience the defeat of this thing because I want to get you where you need to be, face to face with me. Where I can change you from image to image and glory to glory. I'm convinced that the reason some grow faster than others is this principle. Because the rate of change is not something God sovereignly picks. I mean, He doesn't save two people on the same day and have one of them progress spiritually so strong and the other one just creep along. He doesn't do this. You see, the rate of change is determined by how much we're beholding the face of God. So it's not God holding me back or you back. It's God allowing us to experience the things that will drive us to his face. And the more we behold his face, the quicker and faster and more glorious the rate of change. You and I control that. Now, I don't know if it's true or not. I'm going to read, don't turn there, but I'm going to read to you Psalm 105. And then I'm going to bring this to a close. Psalm 105, scholars, there are scholars that spend time trying to determine what psalms David wrote after certain experiences. I don't know if this is accurate or not, but what I have read on numerous occasions is that Psalm 105 was a psalm that was written probably sometime after his experience that I just described to you. And here's what he says. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Speak of all his wonders. Glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. And remember his wonders which he's done, his marvels, and the judgments uttered by his mouth. I don't know. Maybe the scholars are wrong. Maybe they're right. But it sure does fit. It fits a man who has gone to the depths of despair. And he's betrayed his God because of a weakness, because of a weariness. He got tired of running from Saul. 
You may be tired this morning of running from something. You may be tired because there's some area where the enemy has hit you and hit you and hit you and hit you. And I say it again, I'm not talking about holding on to a sin. I'm talking about holding on to an area, maybe an attitude, maybe it's an action, maybe it's become a sin. But listen, you say, I don't understand God. I'm experiencing revival. This ought to all be gone. There ought to be victory. You know, we Christians find it so difficult to be transparent. We don't like to admit we don't have something that we ought to have. And so we hide it and we submerge it. You know what David said? David said in another place, he said, when I hid my sin, and let me tell you, it also applies to weakness. When I hide what God's trying to get at in my life and I submerge it, when I hide it, then what happens is that my bones even become weary. Have you noticed that? You hide something from God, you lose that transparency, that your body begins to waste away. Physically, your strength is gone. Your defenses are just torn apart. Why? Because God is after us seeking His face continually. And He's saying the rate of change will be directly proportioned to how much you spend before me, worshiping me. And that worship is His Word, it's prayer, it's talking to Him at all hours of the day, it's singing songs to Him, it's entering into the depth of worship, it's all of those things. It's putting God there as the central place where there's a constant surrender to Him. And yet we have a tendency to complain about the problem. I'm convinced the victory God wants to bring to your life, to my life, to every Christian's life, is a victory that's so complete See, in his eyes, the devil is already defeated. Circumstances are already defeated. So when we come before God and say, God, this loneliness, this depression, and I do understand that there's sometimes a physical thing with depression, but Lord, this bitterness, this heaviness that's over me. God, do something with it. Lord, Drive it out of my life. Defeat it. God looks and says, what am I supposed to do that I have not already done? What, what is it that made it through somehow the defeat of my cross? What is it? What, what do you want me to do? What, My child, I love you. My grace is here for you. What do you want me to do? What can I do that I have not already done? Do you understand that the victory you're asking for is already there? The problem is you will not experience it until you behold my face. Until you get before me and you drive yourself into me. Listen to me. Not to obtain a victory, but to have communion with God. And when you keep driving yourself forward to say, give me this victory, give me this victory. I understand that from an immature Christian. I understand that from a baby Christian. I understand that from somebody coming out of the world. Oh God, I've got to have victory over this. But when we're in Christ and we've been in Christ and we've matured, there ought to be a cry that comes, God, not for the victory over the sin, but I press through for communion with you. And this thing's trying to rob me and I will not let it have me. And when that happens, God says, they're ready for another level of my glory, a fresh image of me, and a new victory, not by their self-will, but by my spirit. And I'm here to give it to them, just like David. God, what do I do? Do I stay here? under your judgments? Do I stay here ravaged and defeated by the enemy or do I pursue? And God says to you, get up, my son, my daughter, pursue. Pursue what, God? The enemy? No. Inquire at my face. Go after the enemy, but put me. Pursue, pursue, pursue me. Because I've already defeated that which is defeating you. And I'll change you.
so that it will never, ever, ever, ever be able to touch you and defeat you again. I want you to stand with me. And I, Steve, if you'll come. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I want you to, uh, everyone in the Family Life Center stand. Everybody stand. We're going to sing. The chorus that just came to me was, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. I want you to sing this out. This is so true. Brother, what you preached is so true. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. And can we do that one more time? Take it to heart. going to dismiss, but I want everyone to close their eyes, everyone in the Family Life Center. And I want you to think of two things. One, what you're going through right now, whatever it might be. And Brother Phillips mentioned several areas you could be struggling with. I want you to think what is in front of you right now. That's one thing I want you to do. And the other is I want you to think of Christ, what he's already accomplished what he's already done, the victory that's already been won, what he can do in this situation if you'll just look at him. Just look at him. Just look at Jesus. What is it? What problems were you facing before? What were you facing before where God came through for you? What was it two years ago that you were going through and look what God did? What was it five years ago and look what God did? Yes. Why can't he do it again? Why can't he do it again in your life? Look at him. Look at him. Look at Jesus today. Look at Jesus. I want to, yeah, bring that up one little. Let's sing it one more time. Friend, I can feel the Spirit of God. He's going to pull you through this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Yes, Lord. Jesus. Look for Don't forget Tuesday night's prayer meeting and Wednesday night service here and then, of course, revival all week. And before you leave, I want you to turn to somebody and say, I thank God that Rich is not shaving my head. God bless you. Have a great day.